Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Naheem Iqbal from. That's a good start. From Rider <laughs> Architecture. Um, in terms of the BIM Academy, it was set up in June 2011 this year. It's basically a joint venture between Northumbria University and Rider Architecture. Just before I go on, in terms of my background, I'm actually from an engineering background. I studied product design at university. I went on to work for a multidisciplinary organisation in terms of engineering. And then I joined Rider in 2009, where we started looking into how to implement BIM, not only at the design stage, but also through to um, construction and FM. Um, we've been developing our systems up to now. So in terms of when Rider actually started investing in BIM, which was at the back end of 2006, there was a problem. The problem was that Rider were doing it as a single entity, as an architectural practice. Now BIM, to its full extent, doesn't work when you do it as a single practice. <clears throat> it needs the involvement of all the stakeholders within industry, whether that's the engineers, the clients, <clears throat> people in the FM team, people within the supply chain. So the reason we went to actually create a centre of excellence, which is the BIM Academy, was to ensure that we can collaborate with the rest of industry as well as support the implementation of BIM. In terms of the services that the BIM Academy offers, we're working in terms of research and development, education, consultancy, research and development in terms of we're currently developing open source systems and platforms where BIM models can be taken into and clients can log onto the system, view the models, view the information within their models very quickly, very easily. <clears throat> We're also involved in a lot of education. We've been working with Andrew quite a lot in terms of delivering CPDs across most of the regions within the UK. Um, the other thing is you see these individuals in terms of the pictures, they're actually BIM technologists which were employed through the university. These individuals, they get trained in software packages, they get trained in prog um, various programs and they work on live projects. In terms of for BIM to move forward, we understand that there's a need to educate the graduates which are coming out from universities because they're going to be the next generation of pioneers within our industries. <clears throat> Finally, in terms of consulting, we work with a number of different organisations who have approached us because they need consultancy in terms of how to implement BIM, um, what are the timeline, what are the constraints, what are the costs. Um, other aspects are organisations who currently don't have BIM capabilities come to us and say, could you please author a model in terms of do a 3D model for an existing facility or a new building, etc. So working a lot of different work streams in terms of consultancy. <clears throat> the overall aims promote collaborative working, support the supply chain through facilitation, training, resource, innovation in partnership with industry. Independence and impartiality, we're offering advice which isn't really based on any specific software solution, but we certainly have a good idea of what various software packages can do. I said BIM was all about collaboration. No single entity, no single organisation or individual can implement BIM fully. And really that's illustrated in terms of our relationships with industry. I mean, Constructing Excellence is you know, an organisation that we're very close to. We've been working on the BIM work group with Andrew. Um, BIS, the Reba Enterprises, MBS, we're currently working with them on the National BIM Library to actually take manufacturing components and model them in BIM offering tools and to provide them to industries so they can actually download components and assemblies and just drag them into the actual models and from them models you can start extracting quantities. <clears throat> We've done work with RAP which is um, a government body for reducing waste in terms of materials, working with Manchester City Council a lot on the refurbishment scheme for the town hall complex. <clears throat> So we've got a lot of relationships with different bodies and that's not just people from institutions but also academia such as Teesside University and the University of Salford and even Leeds Met. 
Now, what I'm really going to talk about is the Manchester Central Library project, which is part of the wider scheme for refurbishment of the town hall in Manchester. So the circular building on the screen is the library and the building opposite is the town hall. We had Ryder working on the architecture for the library and Ian Simpson's architects were working on the town hall. In terms of how this all started for the idea of using BIM on the library, we actually sat down with John Lorimer at the start of a project and said, John, we're using BIM from an architectural perspective. We have an understanding of what can be done by other disciplines and other users. So we sat down with John and we shared our vision. And luckily, John already had a good understanding of what building information modeling can do. So then John said, let's go for it. Let's give it a try. Let's see what we can do, what can be achieved. So we had a very supportive and a knowledgeable client. <clears throat> What's unique about this project is Number one, it's a refurbishment. There's a perception in our industry that BIM doesn't work on refurbishment. I think that this project actually gets rid of that perception. <clears throat> it's a grade two star listed building which is located in the heart of Manchester. Um, in terms of the overall team, you had Ryder as the architects and Ian Simpsons as the architects. You got URS Scott Wilson who are dealing with the structural aspects, BDP doing the mechanical electrical plumbing systems, Lango Rook, the contractor, and NG Bailey, um, subcontractor. The way this project started off is John had this vision where he wanted all the project team, well not all the project team, but most of the project team to work within a co-located -lo um, office within the Manchester City Council facility. So various members of the team, from Ryder, from Ian Simpsons, from Lango Rook, and from the rest of the team, they're all located to Manchester City Council um, offices. When I say co-located, it's not a simple thing, because you have to think about when we move our team of people into another office, there's a whole IT infrastructure that comes with that. There's a whole way of working in terms of how we lay out our desks, how we work with other people. And it did take a long time to actually put that infrastructure in place, but it was done. And the main benefit of that is rather than having to send an email or make a phone call, which we might take two to three days to get a reply, you can walk a couple of meters and you can talk to the facilities manager. You can walk another couple of meters, you can talk to the contractor. In an instance, it enhances communication and engagement. <clears throat> the vision for using BIM was firstly in the design and construction phases and we said we were going to explore how BIM can be used for FM. In terms of the standard form of contract which was used, it was NEC3, which basically encouraged collaborative working. Overall, on the project, there was no mandate for BIM. People didn't have to use BIM, but there was a vision for it and there was a lot of goodwill within the project team, within the overall stakeholders in terms of architects, <coughs> engineers, and even people within the supply chain. Now one thing we hadn't mastered at the time when we started the actual library project was BIM execution planning. We had an idea that it needed to be done and we did actually voice this concern in terms of towards the rest of the project team. But in terms of the various engineers, consultants involved on the project, there was a various, there's varying levels of expertise. So no one was on the same level, whether it is in terms of software competence or understanding. And that's one of the problems that existed overall. But the BIM execution planning is actually a fundamental aspect on any project to support the implementation of BIM. First of all, there was client understanding and awareness of what BIM is, what can be achieved, what are the work streams of BIM. <clears throat> then we start looking at things like technologies. What technologies does everyone have? What versions of those technologies are being used? Um, how are we going to exchange information between these technologies? What file formats are we going to use? Um, what are the frequency associated with the exchange of that information? The other things such as responsibilities, quality management is all very important. Even model naming conventions because the key isn't the technologies, it's the information. How we control and coordinate that information right from the design construction through to FM. In terms of 
going into the actual use of BIM on the project, two unique things we did in terms of the library were one, there was some form of laser scanning done, done which was mainly for the external part of the building. And that was just to validate the internal dimensions. I mean, back when we started this project, we didn't know much about laser scanning. We didn't know what was out there and what could be achieved. Um, the other unique thing about this project is the way we commissioned the survey. It wasn't a traditional 2D survey, it was a 3D survey where <clears throat> a team was commissioned to create an actual model of the building. And I'm just going to take you into an environment called Navis Works, in which I've actually imported the survey model just for the purpose of demonstration. So this was the actual model which we used in terms of at the initial concept stages. I just really wanted to show you that the level of detail you can actually get from this model. So this model is created in Revit, which is a design authoring tool. There's a lot of other design authoring tools within industry, but the Revit, which was developed by Autodesk, is quite popular. So I then took that model into Navisworks, and Navisworks is basically the collaborative environment. It's very easy to fly around in, it's very easy to start viewing models with other people within the overall project team. I mean, just looking at the amount of details which was initially put into the survey model, if you look at the windows, <clears throat> there's different families of windows which were actually created. And I'm just going to pop down to the basement very quickly just to show you, you know, what kind of level of detail there is down there in terms of structural elements. So overall that's, on a basic level, what you can do with BIM is once you've got that initial model, you can start sitting down with people within your team, you can start reviewing this and you can understand that once you have a fully coordinated model, i.e. you've got the architecture, you've got the structure, you've got the MEP systems, and rather than looking through pieces of paper and you're trying to coordinate the design, tools like Navis Works, you can do systematic clash detection rather than spend five days on a project to find all the clashes, you can do it within five to ten min minutes in terms of identify the clashes and then start allocating the activities to get rid of them clashes. Very useful tool in terms of clash detection because what you're doing is you're not only ident um, saving time in finding those clashes but you're actually reducing waste before the project hits on site at, const at construction stage. I think there's a quote within industry which is used quite a lot every great building should be built twice, once using BIM and once in reality, and this is how it's actually working right now. So once we've also got the initial model of the existing facility, you've got engineers who can start doing various parts of the analysis in terms of looking at thermal analysis, air flows on the existing building. When we, do an, when we actually enhance the design, and we can retest that model to see what the improvement is, is. So we start looking at building performance relatively quite earlier on. This is the stage what we're at now. That basic survey model has been developed much more in terms of the concept design. And we're into the detailed design stages now. So this is the actual Revit model. And these are some of the sections which we're producing at the Revit model. We can start taking quantities from that model. We can start creating drawings within the same environment. I mean, if you think about it, if we were to go around and start counting up all the doors, internal doors, it would take us a long time. Using BIM, we can do it within a minute. So in terms of the quality of information being created, it's all um, of a very high level. The thing with using BIM in the design authoring stages is the accuracy of information. When we create something in plan view, that view automatically updates in terms of the elevations or any sections. You don't have to recreate that information. That information retains its integrity. It retains its quality. Also, when you're using technology such as design authoring tools, people think 3D views, they're only for the wow factor, but it actually enhances communication and engagement. And that's throughout the life cycle. So the next stage was then people or the actual disciplines had developed their own models and we actually brought their models together to start coordinating the design. 
So you've got Manchester Central Library on the bottom left, and at the top you had the Town Hall project. <clears throat> so bringing all these elements together, started coordinating the design, flushing out all the errors, it was all done in the BIM environment. On the right hand side, you've got the architectural and structural elements being coordinated, again using BIM, BIM workflows. In our industry today, there is a big gap between design and manufacturing. <clears throat> and in terms of the library, we wanted to demonstrate how this gap could actually be closed. What we were dealing with was a very complicated soffit. Um, it was a concrete soffit. And as you can see, the shape, the geometry is very complex. It actually isn't flat in any single one area. And we had the option of just giving the manufacturer the 2D drawings, which you know it was going to take them some time to actually get around to actually put it through to their software in terms of computer aided manufacturing. So what we did was we actually took the design model and we broke it down into segments and we then provided the manufacturer with the geometry file of the soffit and they took that file straight through to the computer aided manufacturing so they didn't have to recreate any information which would have um, resulted in inconsistencies um, it would have took much more time in order to manufacture the various elements so that's just an idea of what you can do using BIM in terms of taking it from the design through to manufacturing stages we've also got Lango Rock working on the project as a contractor and they're using BIM for construction sequencing construction sequencing is basically taking the 3D model linking it to the construction program and actually being able to visualize the build of the facility. I'm just gonna play a short video to demonstrate what Manchester, uh, sorry, Lango Rock are doing. It's a construction of a core. So they've bought in, in this instance, they've only bought in the architectural and the structural elements. And normally you can see the time of when these activity, activities are actually happening, but for some reason it's not on this video. <clears throat> so I'm sure you get the idea from the video that rather than going on site and starting building it, there's more efficiency in doing it in the virtual environment. You can suss out all the errors. You can suss out basically <clears throat> if the construction sequencing can be improved. The other related aspects are health and safety planning. I mean, if things can be visualized in the virtual environment, people can know, especially teams on site, they know when they shouldn't be in a certain area because a certain activity is gonna happen, be happening. Or people within the supply chain who have got to deliver materials on site, if they know the time and date of when a specific activity is happening, they'll know when to get their team on site. So I won't go through the rest of the video, but I'm sure you will get what's possible using BIM within the construction stages. Manchester City Council have this vision to use BIM in the FM stages. So there was no baseline at the start of a project for you know what information was required at FM. That was because everyone was still exploring what we could do with BIM, what could be achieved. So, but Manchester City Council still have the vision of taking BIM forward in terms of FM use. When we talk about FM use, this is a solution called Artra, which is one of the many technologies out there in terms of industry which actually deal with using BIM in FM. So we've brought in the actual model in terms of architectural, structural, MEP models, even the ff &E systems into this environment. And if you click on any element within this model, it will come up with information about that element or about that space. For example, if you've got asbestos in the building in certain locations, which is very useful to the FM team, or if you've got radiators or fan cooling units and you click on that element and you want to replace that element, you know who the manufacturer is, you, you know who the supplier is. This is very efficient because normally what happens is the client gets given a folder or a couple of hundred folders which have all the information in regarding FM rather than having to filter through all that information 
they have a so solution here where they can start use basic searches in terms of if you want to look at a, you know where all the columns are on a certain level what types of columns they are and etc when do they need to be rechecked in terms of the life cycle analysis you can do all that within this solution <clears throat> you can also start linking various other documents but this is you know, is this still the basic stage? I mean, there's another stage where we can start linking such, such systems through to building management systems so we can actually see live performance monitoring of buildings. What we're currently development, de developing at the BIM Academy is actually an FM solution where we can take any BIM model. It doesn't matter what format it was made in. You can just take it, put it into an online database system and the client can view it online and they can start clicking on the various elements and objects within the model, they can start looking at embodied carbon, which is automatically calculated. So there's still a lot which needs to be done in terms of the software development side of things. One thing I missed at the start was that Salford University were appointed to do a research study on the project itself to determine to what level BIM had been used on the project. Um, the actual maturity level of what was being done on Manchester City Library. According to this model, which is a different model to the one Andrew was talking about, um, this model shows that really in terms of the overall project, we're still not exploring a lot of the areas where BIM can create synergy. I'm talking about all the white areas within on, on the diagram. So the blue actually shows where we actually are in terms of how we've exploited BIM. According to this maturity model on a scale of 0 to 10, even though all the stuff I've showed you, you know, it's really good and, you know, there's been a lot of benefit in terms of informed decision make, making, communication, engagement, taking out the clashes. We're still only touching the surface of this concept, technologies, processes <clears throat> and etc. The green blob actually shows the average for industry itself, so we are still ahead in terms of what we're doing on the library project in terms of our use of BIM compared to the average industry. <clears throat> but there's so many more areas which still need to be explored. I think it's important to know, I think I did this seminar um, a couple of days ago um, within London and somebody asked you know, why all the white areas? And I think that's really down to the way our education and awareness when we started the project, we knew how to use BIM from an architectural perspective, but there was a bigger picture in terms of integrating all the disciplines. And it's easy talking about it, but it's very hard. And there is an actual <clears throat> learning curve to doing it within reality. I mean, a lot of lessons have been learned on the projects and there are, there are probably a lot of things which have been would have been done differently on a new project, whether that's from the client perspective, from an architect's perspective, or people within the supply chain. Just to finish off, um, overall, from our work on Manchester Central Library, you know, there's a clear realisation that BIM can be used on public sector projects, not only public sector projects, but also refurbishment schemes. <clears throat> Just to emphasise again the importance of BIM execution planning, getting everyone involved at the start of a project, identifying capabilities, looking at deliverables, the education and awareness right from the client to people within the supply chain is very important. To start engaging teams from the FM side at the initial concept stages and briefing stages to understand what their requirements are for downstream I mean, what do they need to get out in terms of to manage and operate their facility and to identify the technologies and the deliverables at the start through BIM execution planning and education and awareness. Now, I said at the start that BIM wasn't mandated to be used on the Central Library, the Manchester Town Hall complex. There was a vision and there was a lot of good goodwill within the teams that were being deployed to complete the project. Um, and I think that's a very important aspect. I mean, you know, yes, it is about technology. It's about the processes you use. But the people, the talent, the skill that comes from our industry, I think it's phenomenal. And you need to take that skill and you actually need to bring people together 
it doesn't matter if you know there might be a conflict of interest or what you really don't want is people going back to the traditional ways of working in their own silos I mean, that's what traditionally happens BIM basically brings people together and when you bring people together that's when you can actually create more innovation so there are the key things of technology process people understanding the technologies what they can do what are the capabilities what are the functionalities <clears throat> and how they can they be integrated across the various work streams from design construction facilities management and um, prefabrication the processes that are involved from getting information from technologies um, through to various organizations and again people people do need upskilling they need education they need awareness they need to know what BIM can do and how it can be delivered yes behind that there is investment I mean you know not investment just in terms of industry itself but industry also from the academic perspective the graduates need to know how to use tools in terms of BIM technologies or workflows when they come out from finishing university or college just overall just finishing off I think the importance of is on information that's what we're taking from the briefing stages through the life cycle it's the creation the structuring and the exchange of that information that is very important that needs to be a coordinated process overall that's me finished thank you very much